Because of that, because they are being more pragmatic, and because Iran, through uh, its own interests in the region, is being more pragmatic, uh, th that pragmatism has brought the two sides together and allowed for a new kind of uh, assessment about what is in our interest. Now, with that, uh, we have to also understand that you know, in 1979, even until 2001, there was this sense that you know the U.S. is the superpower and what the U.S. wants goes. So Saudi Arabia was not inclined to go against the United States. I think uh, when Donald Trump first came to power, it was still not clear that we are in a multipolar world. I think uh, since uh, since 2020, uh, since 2022, certainly since the um, Russia-Ukrainian war, we are seeing the death knells of the rules-based order, the liberal international order. And, and we're seeing the rise of BRICS. We're seeing China much more involved economically. We're seeing... Uh, you know, various power centers. And um, Saudi Arabia just simply doesn't want to be left behind. Hello, everybody. This is Pascal from Neutrality Studies. And today I've got Dr. Arto Moeni with me again. Dr. Moeni is the Director of Research and Head of US Operations at the, at the Institute for Peace and Diplomacy, a think tank in North America. He researches the future of the international order and grand strategy from a realist perspective, and he writes a lot of very useful analytical essays. He also tweets regularly on Twitter X about important events like the recent rapprochement between Iran and Saudi Arabia and being a Europe and Middle East or West Asia expert uh, I wanted to talk to Dr. Moeni about just that, uh, the how Iran and Saudi Arabia are now getting closer to each other and what does what that means in grand strategic terms. So, Dr. Moeni, welcome. Thank you, Pascal, for having me again. Uh, it's great to be on your show, as always, and uh, glad to have a conversation. Well, um, you wrote this Twitter, this short little Twitter piece saying, like, this information or this, this new found exchange, diplomatic exchange between Saudi Arabia and Iran is heavily underestimated in its importance because it changes the picture of the Middle East in general. Could you maybe expand on that? Sure. Um, so what I'm trying to you know, get at is that, you know, the, the strategic environment in the Middle East in 2024, uh, you know, this is with or without uh, Trump even getting to office. Uh, is a very different uh, picture than than 2016. A lot has changed uh, in, the, in the eight intervening years, and it would be a mistake to assume that it's business as usual, as if uh, you know it's it's 2016, 2018, or even 2020. Um, one of the major things that has changed is the nature of the Iran relationship with Arab countries, especially in the Persian Gulf uh, and Saudi Arabia. And uh, you know we uh, want. Since the um, since the Russian invasion of Ukraine um, in uh, 22, and then after that, followed by October 7th, th those are two important uh, events that have happened that have changed the calculus of uh, you know the you know also U.S. allies in the region, especially Saudi Arabia, uh, to focus more on both self-reliance and also not being too closely uh, one-sided, um, and. Since then, and uh, you know, within the course of the Biden administration, Saudi Arabia under Mohammed bin Salman has made certain changes uh, in its approach to, the, to Iran, uh, and this was also uh, with Iran also making the decision that it cannot afford to have such high tensions with its neighbors. So Iran has, uh, you know, for its reasons, tried to be much more, um, uh, much more, uh, you know a force for regional stability and trying to find rapprochement with all of its Arab neighbors. Um, and Saudi Arabia also has uh, benefited from the escalation with Iran. So starting in 2023, they made a series of changes in their relationship and uh, restored their ties that had been, uh, you know, severed for, for a number of years. And um, that original sort of move uh, was orchestrated, as you may remember, by China. Uh, both sides wanted to make, uh, you know, be trading partners to China in the Middle East. And uh, China sort of allowed or pushed for this kind of uh, agreement because China wants to be the non-ideological actor and just wants to make business with various countries. So it kind of, uh, let me say, strongly encouraged both sides to come to the table. But uh, 
it would be a mistake to think that this was China's doing. It was also in the strategic interests of both Iran and Saudi Arabia to do so. And so once the thawing happened, we entered a period of detente. But the detente and the series of conversations that started in Baghdad uh, and with uh, also Oman's uh, always uh, encouragement as a neutral state. I know you, we have a there's a neutrality channel. I, I think Oman's uh, role is always also underestimated in the in the happenings of the Middle East. Um, but that detente over the past uh, you know over the past year, especially since October seven, has moved towards an entente. And now we are not only talking about shared economic interests. We are also talking about defense cooperation, even. We are talking about uh, increasing defense ties. We are talking about a different understanding of the uh, of the sort of security circumstance in the Middle East. We are also thinking about, um, you know, much higher level of diplomatic engagement and a new front shaping uh, in the Middle East against uh, what's perceived as Israeli sort of actions or uh, overreach. So I think we're just in a very different sort of strategic environment. And part of part of it, uh, you know, is also to recognize that you know when we when we do deals, when we do Abraham Accords, or when we do sort of Iran Saudi diplomatic engagement, these are um, yes, they are they are actions that we take, and they're fo they're formalizing things that are already underground, they're already systemic. So when we have systemic shifts, um, you know, then we have then we see it in sort of diplomatic presence and diplomatic formalities, but. Uh, it is al almost always a mistake to think that it is the it is the you know it is one act that comes before the systemic changes. So I think uh, you know we have to understand the structure in the Middle East and the changes and the realignment in the Middle East and the ways that both countries are are thinking that they benefit from a closer cooperative relationship. And how how was that possible? Because like in if you look at Iran's, let's say Iran's predicaments in, in its own environment, like there was a very long period, what well, there was a 15, 20 years, basically, of almost warfare, of, of warfare, um, direct and indirect with Iraq, right? And then that one vanished because the Americans basically took care of, of Iraq for Iran. But then it transformed into a strategic rivalry with Saudi Arabia. Where did that strategic rivalry come from? And why did they almost like, they they blew each other like uh, each other up in like in uh, also with like the little, the proxies or their their little their little allies that they had in the region and now this is going away and you're saying it's not just a rapprochement it's an entente it's like they are starting to work properly together and perceive each other as actual potential maybe if not allies then at least friends yeah, how yeah. is that possible. Well, first of all, uh, the reason that the move the move towards Entente is comes out of very, very sort of realistic assessment of interests, a realistic understanding of of what is in the national interest of both countries and its regional stability. I think both countries are are very, very aware and cognizant of the fact that uh, what is happening, especially through U.S. led relationships, is is uh, you know ski, uh, severing sort of certain ties in the region, creating certain types of instability and escalation. And I think what they don't want is any kind of regional escalation or uh, any kind of threat to stability. Because if you want to, you know, if you're Saudi Arabia and want to do you know the Vision 2030, if you want to do all these grand economic projects, and if you want to, you know. Uh, you don't want to spend most of your money on defense, and you also you want to you you need that stability because other you want to you want to in, uh, invite others in to invest in you. If you're Iran uh, and you really do believe that uh, it is, you know, it is, uh, uh, you know, the West uh, and especially Israel as the proxy for the West has certain designs on you. You don't want to waste your time spending uh, in in sort of rivalries with with uh, other. Um, second order powers from your perspective that you believe are not genuine threats to you. So you want to try to, uh, you know, find a platform, a kind of architecture in which you can actually have uh, a different vision for security that's much more inclusive and integrated. But, so, uh, but, 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 the, but the roots of all this goes back all the way to the Iranian revolution. And we can talk about that much, uh, much more. But, but that, uh, you know, 1979 fundamentally was two different perspectives for the Middle East. But I think in 2024, after all of these years and decades of conflict, and um, I, I mean, proxy wars, but also a, really a cold war between Iran and Saudi Arabia, that has thawed um, because uh, interests have per uh, persevered 
and they have been prioritized over ideology by both sides. Why is it possible now? I mean, what you're saying about the strategic predicaments was true 20 years ago. Uh, uh, Iran would have had an interest in having having better relations with its environment and Saudi Arabia. And, and Saudi Arabia had a very successful like economic rise and had an interest in a stable Middle East ever since. Why is it that they now switch toward, uh, toward getting along with each other? Well, uh, one thing to consider is that, first of all, the Iranian Revolution in 1979 is, was a very ideological force. And it was a Shiite first revolution. It saw the world in Shiite terms, and it saw it as sort of a defense against Western aggression and colonialism and imperialism and all that. But it was a very kind of a revolutionary and, and Shiite presence. And immediately after, you know, it was about exporting the revolution, right? So from the Saudi Arabian perspective, it, it was not only an ally of the West, it was also a much traditionalist power that was uh, that, and, and it was Sunni, and it was at the time even supporting Salafi groups all the way until uh, 9/11. So we have a very different. So there was a there was a kind of a status quo traditionalist monarchist um, viewpoint that was tied to Sunni and Salafi ideology in Saudi Arabia, clashing with a revolutionary anti-monarchist, uh, anti-Sunni uh, kind of doctrine that was. Uh, purported to be exported from Iran. Uh, you know, in a way that Iran was a populist movement at the time, whereas, uh, you know, the, the Saudi Arabian side was taking a, taking a bet of the status quo and establishment. So I'm um, putting it out in context of, you know, some of the uh, more Western viewers who are uh, going through something like this at the moment in Europe and, and, and the US. So I think it's, uh, it's important to acknowledge that at, at the time, it's very uh, understandable because we have to understand foreign policy as a, as a reflection of domestic politics. And the domestic politics of Iran and the domestic politics of Saudi Arabia at the time were completely in opposite sides. And then the, uh, you know, the war in Iraq happened, you know, all the, um, you know, uh, Arab countries mostly supported Saudi, uh, supported Iraq against the Iran war. Iran was very aggrieved by that move. And so it was it just the, the atmosphere of distrust since 1979 was very profound. Now, the, the thing with ideology is, is, is that if you're not um, a great power, if you're not a superpower, if you're if you're not if your power is not limitless, you have to you know deal with reality and live within the bounds of reality. And so the reality has changed over the past forty years, um, and we are now really seeing a different kind of realignment. And we saw that especially after you know some of the um, you know uh, Saudi Arabian leaders, I would say, with Mohammed bin Salman at the top at the helm. Have, have had a complete reassessment of what they want Saudi Arabia to be. They don't want Saudi Arabia to be a vassal of the United States any longer. And they have taught, basically, um, they have basically come on top and, uh, you know, distanced themselves from, from the more Sunni Islamist elements. Uh, and so because of that, because they're being more pragmatic and because Iran, through uh, its own interests in the region, is being more pragmatic, uh, th that pragmatism has brought the two sides together and allowed for a new kind of uh, assessment about what is in our interest. Now, with that, uh, we have to also understand that, you know, in 1979, even until 2001, there was this sense that, you know, the U.S. is the superpower and what the U.S. wants goes. So Saudi Arabia was not inclined to go against the United States. I think uh, when Donald Trump first came to power, it was still not clear that we are in a multipolar world. I think uh, since uh, since 2020, uh, since 2022, certainly since the um, Russia-Ukrainian war, we are seeing the death knells of the rules-based order, the liberal international order, and, and we're seeing the rise of BRICS. We're seeing China much more involved economically. We're seeing, uh, you know, various power centers, and um, Saudi Arabia just simply doesn't want to be left behind. Of, of that tectonic shift. It, it, this doesn't mean that Saudi Arabia is going to join the you know the non-Western bloc. Uh, Saudi Arabia actually wants to exercise more patience and neutrality with respect to both sides and try to try to act uh, within its own uh, interests. And I think that is something to be um, to be welcome. 
Yeah, and I mean, both of them are now part of the BRICS and other scholars have made the point that BRICS is not a counter concept to the West. It's the antithesis basically of not block building, but mm -hmm. of uh, fostering multi-alignment. So do you think that's where Saudi Arabia is going? It's not going to oppose the US. It's just going to play with more with more friends on the ground. Yes, yes. I think I think it is a mistake to think to have any kind of a block thinking, to think of in Manichaean terms, to think in terms of new Cold Wars, both with China or with, with this Eurasian mass. Uh, it's, it's very uh, very easy to hear such talk in Washington, unfortunately, but I think we have to understand that uh, the United States can be great and can be powerful if it understands that it has to deal with this new world. And the new world's uh, kind of logic has shifted from unipolarity, from unilateral action, not to multilateral action, but just the, the, the entire game has shifted to something that is much more regional and in a much more regional environment, you need to vary, you're going to have to deal with various players in different regions and it means therefore multi-alignment. So we are living in a, uh, I don't even want to use the word multipolar because, you know, as you know, with structural realism, multipolarity means certain material power. I think we have to, we, the world is shifting away from this kind of globalist mentality, which we had uh, for much of uh, Western IR theory uh, in the 20th century, a utilitarian analysis, much more to a much more cultural, regional, civilizational understanding, which is uh, which is predicated on multi-alignment, but multi-nodal and polycentric systems, uh, which are which is not necessarily just one, two, or three power, power players. It doesn't mean that, you know, um, we are going to have an inclusive 180 country kind of international law framework. I, I think that is too idealistic, but I do believe that we're going to see, uh, you know, as we're seeing with the BRICS, a number of countries get seat on the table. And, you know, those, you know, 10, 12, 15 countries will be much more influential in, in this different decisions around the world. We have, uh, you know, I've called it the concept of civilizations uh, and also uh, Nick Petro and I, uh, for, uh, you know, from at IPD, we have uh, written about this as well, about the new concept of civilizations idea. So, uh, you know, both, I think, cultural realism, the concept of uh, civilizations around regions, I think they both kind of bode for a different kind of understanding of, uh, of, of world politics. Uh, and I think the actions of various states, uh, you know, historically um, antagonistic with, uh, with various ideological problems with one another, moving towards this direction of understanding that they just need to figure out a way to coexist. Uh, having a peacefully coexistent uh, model is uh, is something that is it is taking shape, shape whether or not uh, the United States and European allies want it or not. And I think increasingly you will, you will see even Europe and, and other allies like Japan and South Korea understand this new reality and want to have a seat at the table. This is going to take some time. It's not going to be very quick, but I think we are seeing uh, a very important chapter of this unfolding in the Middle East. And I think we can also not ignore the 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 change to uh, you know Western prestige and understanding of the world and the kind of the, the phoniness of some of the uh, some of the rules based uh, uh, you know schemes or uh, propaganda around that with with the war um, you know in Gaza and Israel, which because it is uh, associated uh, with the West as much as it is with Israel. Do you think that the genocide on the people in Gaza at the moment is actually impacting the um, the, the strategic thinking of like Muslim states in the neighborhood uh, or is that a separate is that a separate thing I, I mean I'm, I'm gonna push back against the word genocide because I think I think what we are seeing is uh, I don't want to get into whether or not it is a genocide or not, because I think it's actually a completely different world that we're moving towards. I think the very discussion of a genocide was a kind of a World War II kind of uh, discussion, was was an international standard kind of discussion, was was that there is something right and moral and we're going to uh, you know live up to that. And it's good for everyone to have these kinds of rules and standards. But what people forgot was that this has all to do with uh, the power of the West at the time and 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 to be able to actually decide uh, what the law should be and how to interpret the law. What we are seeing in a multipolar world is that there are various interpretations. And uh, and so the kind of moralistic doctrines are not going to be uh, at least as persuasive. We're going to be uh, moving towards a world that's far more realist-based and interest-based. But in terms of 
narratives and the battle of narratives, different regions of the world are going to ac appreciate different narratives. Uh, precisely because we're moving away from this kind of uh, a formalistic understanding of you know, the world and law and morality. So we're moving towards something that's more regional. And obviously in the Middle East and West Asia, um, the, the, the narrative that is going to be uh, heard and rece received is the you know, population displacement and replacement of Israel uh, you know, by Israel of, of the Arab uh, and Palestinian sort of inhabitants in Gaza and elsewhere. So I think uh, taking that in mind, this is how they will see it, uh, irrespective of what is or is not uh, a, a genocide. I think this is uh, completely going to shift the understanding of government, especially Arab governments in the region. Um, if your entire population is positively angry about uh, what is uh, taking place in Gaza and the lack of ceasefire and and it, and it, you know uh, putting the language aside death the death toll on civilians has been very very high um, so th just taking that I think is uh, something that the Arab population the domestic politics in these regions even in Saudi Arabia means that there is a big big pressure on uh, rulers in Saudi Arabia UAE and elsewhere to have clear demarcations and lines uh, with uh, with that uh, you know with their fellow brother uh, Arabs as well as as it's as seen uh, and demarcation against Israel for doing so. So I think um, yes, domestic politics is always very important, and we ignore the importance of domestic politics. We, this is going to also be very valid in terms of um, in terms of Turkey, for example, um, and. I believe that if we uh, understand again what is happening, this war and this escalation and the and the tits for tats and all of that for you know um, more than a year now, I think that is um, that has really put I think Israel in a very uh, hard footing vis-a-vis uh, -vis all the other countries, even countries that wanted to be friends with it or are or are friends with it. Uh, they just can't embrace uh, uh, Israel as much as much as even if they wanted to. So. I think that that has created a different perception instead of you know schisms between you know Sunnis and Shiites you know or Turks and Iranians or all of that we are moving towards something in which is like well the region as a whole stands against uh, this kind of instability and escalation and atrocity and brutality or whatever however it is that the region sees it which becomes kind of like the question of you know uh, what uh, really Iran has been trying to say for a while, uh, which is kind of like we want to have a region-based, uh, you know, security order from the Iranian perspective, an Islamic-based, you know, these Islamic countries together uh, cooperating against uh, outsiders. Now, uh, you know, I, I think there is a possibility, there was and there maybe still could be a possibility where when Israel could have been uh, at least showing itself to Turkey and, and Arab countries as a part of this uh, security order. But that possibility becomes bleaker by the day. Now, what, what you just laid out is a very useful way of thinking about how um, <clears throat> about the interplay of uh, domestic and international politics and also uh, of the of the power of these kind of narratives, right? So the, the point is a bit that a shared understanding of the narratives of what's happening to the Palestinians then informs popular popular sentiment, which in turn the rulers have to react to, which then informs the way that they try to somehow foster international relations. Now, in a in a way, this would mean that the more the the Israel Israel's onslaught or Israel's Israel's uh, um, war war against the Palestinians increases, the higher the the propensity of the Arab states to actually kind of bond together, if not to fight Israel, then at least to kind of forge uh, a common ties between them. Is that is that what what you also are foreseeing? Yeah. Yes. I mean, I think I think it is. I do believe that it is in the interest of Israel to try to find a ceasefire and end the wars. But at the same time, uh, I also understand the you know huge insecurity that Israel and some some elements of Israeli society have felt. Um, but but that that doesn't mean that uh, you know they can um, you know that insecurity that psychological sense of insecurity uh, you know you want you want cooler heads to prevail and you want people that can engage with their neighbors and understand that you know war and escalation is not good things to actually get get to power um, but I think 
And I think, you know, one thing that might be uh, interesting is, is, you know, Donald Trump's promises that, you know, the war in Gaza has to come to an end uh, by the time he gets to office or very early uh, when he gets into office. And, and, you know, maybe that's part of, you know, the Trump version of bear hugging Israel will be to try to force it to through through its uh, immense friendship. Uh, with Israel and Israeli state to give it that sense of security to to uh, back down in, in certain wars. And I think maybe that will happen. But but in general, I think so long as the wars continue, so long as this perception of impunity on the Israeli side, that, you know, they can basically do anything and nobody will say anything. And the world is basically against, uh, you know, us as Arabs or us as Muslims or, you know, at the, in, the, in, that, in that region. I think that perception uh, in, in West Asia, in the Middle East, uh, will be very hard for uh, for states to ignore. And I think it can uh, be a cause for social unrest. It can be a cause for even revolution. So I think you cannot uh, you cannot ignore that. I mean, again, if you understand uh, and know anything about Iranian politics and Iranian revolution, one of the major uh, reasons for the Iranian revolution was the perception that Iran was a vassal of the United States, even back in the back in the 70s. Uh, and 60s. So, so this is not uh, going to be limited to Iran now because it's, it's you know, the, the Iranians had this sense of, uh, this, uh, I guess, even back in the day, a sovereignist sense. It was expressed through uh, Islamist, Islamism and Islamic doctrine, but it, it came out of a sense of, uh, you know, wanting strategic autonomy and sovereignism. Now, imagine, you know, Iranians are necessarily, the people in Iran today they don't have, don't feel much uh, affinity necessarily with Palestinians, you know, they're Arabs or Persians. But in, imagine what will be in the Arab streets. The, the sense is that you know this is this is a this is a shameful behavior by their governments that have not been able to stop this, and what they clearly see as an atrocity. So um, working, and again, this is um, I, I just want to mention this as well because like uh, the, the Iranian government has certain problems with its own population. Who also believe that Iran is too involved in in different wars and in the region, uh, forsaking themselves or the, their, their own its own population. But Iran and the Iranian government is actually very very is at the height of its popularity in the Arab world. So it is very um, it is very hard for um, you know Arab governments like Saudi Arabia to ignore that sentiment um, and and just try to accept uh, you know Israeli and Western attacks on Iran. So again, all of this means that uh, the, it explains why uh, Mohammed bin Salman is the number one and UAE is number two that come out and say, uh, you know, the, the Israeli attack um, in re retaliation to uh, October 1st, the Iranian retaliation in the tit for tat, the, the Israeli attack was unacceptable and a, and a violation. Or that they, um, you know, or that Mohammed bin Salman's uh, recent speech was all about uh, respecting Iranian sovereignty. Uh, to to sort of Western partners, and uh, and the fact that you know basically Abraham Accords and Saudi uh, Israeli normalization is off the table, um, all of those things is because of the way that uh, uh, you know systemic shifts have happened, but also the way that Israel itself, out of its own sense of insecurity and sense of righteous defense uh, in the Israeli side, uh, egged on by by elements in the West and in the United States, has perceived its kind of role as to you know, never again kind of uh, foreign policy where he wants to make sure he doesn't have any security threat. But again, you cannot resolve, as we learned in 9-11, you cannot resolve uh, problems of terrorism and, and insurgency and uh, through through military action. There are fundamental systemic and social so, and societal reasons for why these kinds of attacks happen. And um, it's very easy to just say, we're going to eliminate this one group. But yeah, even if you're successful in eliminating Hamas or even Hezbollah, which doesn't look likely. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, even if you are, though, there's going to be a different group with a different name that's going to come out and it's going to do the same exact thing, but except with much more vitriol and much more power and much more uh, sense of righteousness uh, than the last one. So it is, uh, it is again, I think in, in America, um, we do have a, um, a relationship with the state of Israel that that is uh, really close, and I think it is in the interest of both uh, America and American statesmen, but also Israeli statesmen, to find a way to resolve that conflict uh, and try to try to find a way in which uh, Israel too can move towards rapprochement, which is right now looking very unlikely. I, I completely agree with you, but there is a problem, which is that there's that there's people in high office and high power 
who don't. They have a completely different outlook. And if like for realists like you and I, we realize that it took the United States 20 years to replace a Taliban regime with a Taliban regime. And it was 20 years and it failed. And the US was the unipolar single biggest military and, and soft power power on this planet. And it replaced the Taliban with the Taliban, right? That's the outcome of the entire Afghanistan tragedy. Now, there are people in Washington who still think that you could just flatten it on. Um, and it looks to me right now, and I want to ask your opinion about this, that the, the Donald Trump is now picking people that exchange neocon hawks against Russia with neocon hawks against Iran and China. Um, but what is your interpretation of the of the cabinet picks that we have seen so far from from Donald Trump? Because you're you seem to allude that Trump actually wants to scale down the warfare with Iran, but it looks to me that the people that he picks are like quite bad at achieving that goal. What what do you think about that? I, mean, I, th I, th I, th I think that's a fair that's a fair um, that's a fair point. Um, I think the intentions of Donald Trump are not to have new wars and certainly end these ones. I think uh, Donald Trump is uh, serious about his dismay and displeasure at wars. I think he has a personal revulsion against war and human suffering. I, I do believe that. But at the same time, I think that, um, you know, uh, President Link Trump believes that he will control his cabinet and he will tell people what to do. Um, and I worry that he may underestimate the fact that it's not just one person that you're going to control, you know, yes, uh, they will have to carry out your orders. But if you have someone like, uh, you know, um, uh, Rubio, uh, for example, at, at State Department, uh, being a, being that he's an ideological pick, he has, he has had a very consistent ideological framework. And unless he's told not to do something, which he may very well accept and do as the president asks, what, what the, you know, I think this is what, this is what, uh, big personalities like Donald Trump and others in history tend to do. They underestimate the power of uh, the power of systems and structures and bureaucracy. Now, Donald Trump is coming in with a mandate to completely shift, you know, many of that deep state bureaucratic element. But um, it will be, you know, you have to still understand that even if you want to change parts of that, and I think, again, the appointment of someone like Tulsi Gabbard is highly encouraging. Even the appointments of, you know, another restrainer like Matt Gates. Uh, uh, could be very helpful in, in other aspects in terms of surveillance and FISA and other other ways in which uh, the freedom of speech of certain um, people who have been against the, the wars and interventions of the United States have been violated. But putting that aside, I think you still have certain elements like Michael Waltz and and uh, and uh, uh, Senator Rubio who have these ideological elements and uh, beliefs and you know, view of the world is very Manichaean in their mindset. It is us versus them. It's very zero sum. And, um, you know, they will still have a, a huge input on that bureaucracy. And they're not going to be as amenable to changing the entire bureaucracy um, uh, if it means less, uh, less force posture or less interventionism. Or, you know, um, it means that they will perhaps interpret those kinds of changes as a defeat instead of a, a positive change. So we need to understand that the blob and the deep state is, it runs in various dimensions. And one of the major parts of it is, uh, you know, the national security state, but also the foreign policy is an important part of the national security state. So having people who understand that, you know, that they are um, either not ideological or are aligned with Donald Trump on, on the uh, need to, you know, end the wars and not start new wars. Um, for uh, and and basically expand and entangle uh, U.S. troop presence in various regions around the world. That that is that would be uh, a very positive move. Um, but again, I think my worry is that you know some of the some of the uh, appointments might not necessarily um, again uh, they will not maybe publicly be against uh, um, a Trump uh, position on ending the Ukraine war or even uh, pulling out U.S. troops from the Middle East. But um, but again, they will have their impact. They will, they're, you know, choosing neocons uh, like John Bolton, for example, the last time. Yes, uh, Donald Trump was thinking that he is using uh, Bolton as a... As a um, attack dog. As, as an attack dog, as a deal-making uh, 
way and tool. But the fact is that John Bolton had a huge sway on a whole bunch of other stuff when when Trump was not uh, you know directly engaged um, on on so you know it's a huge bureaucracy and John Bolton was doing his thing. And so having the, the people that are fundamentally not aligned with the president um, and with his message and with his um, with his kind of general perspective um, is uh, is going to maybe uh, be counterproductive. Uh, again, we'll see how that pans out this time around, but I'm always skeptical of people who have ideological postures and positions coming into positions that, uh, you know, um, that we want realism and interest-based thinking to predominate. That's um, those are all good and valuable points. And maybe for the last couple of minutes, just let me ask about what you think again in the in the Middle East, in West Asia, the future is going to hold for um, decisions of these local local communities. So one of the things is, for instance, that we have seen the Iraqi government officially asking the US, please leave. Go away, um, take away your your soldiers and your bases. We don't want you here anymore. And the U.S. is saying, nope, we're staying. And in Syria, the, the it's also quite clear the U.S. will continue um, stationing its troops or occupying uh, about a third um, of the Syrian territory. Um, we and we have similar dynamics in, in 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 other regions where there is a serious displeasure with the the physical stationing of of U.S. troops. But there's there's very mixed signals. Let's say when it comes to Egypt um, and an Egyptian co uh, cooperation with the United States. W uh, what do you think is the 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 f uh, is the is the structural power of these places to ask for more strategic autonomy going to increase, or is this something that the U.S. at, at least for the time being can still ignore? Um, I don't think the United States can ignore uh, the, the structural shifts anywhere. Uh, that's both internationally, but definitely regionally. And um, I also think that one of the things that we will see increasingly is that I think even even the uh, incoming uh, Trump administration with uh, you know, in, on certain issues it might be more hawkish, and in other issues it might uh, not. But um, but in terms of U.S. presence in the region, I think what I hear is that there is general agreement among everybody that co that's coming in that that U.S. troop presence in uh, especially the Middle East and maybe perhaps parts of Europe is uh, unnecessary, and we can move and roll back those presences. So in a way, the argument would be that you know if uh, no matter what happens, uh, even whether we want the wars to end or if if we love Israel so much and we will help it to escalate, no matter which of these we choose, we don't want the U.S. troops to be in the middle of a of a regional war. So both in Syria and in Iraq, I think there is general consensus among uh, incoming people, even people who uh, might be uh, considered neocons, that we should pull back U.S. troops. Uh, and because, I mean, again, uh, whether or not they believe it or not, this is something that uh, Donald Trump certainly believes, and I think it's uh, it's something that we might uh, be uh, seeing as uh, as a positive development in terms of uh, lesser lesser U.S. stations and U.S. presence in the Middle East uh, being sitting ducks in in wars. Now, in terms of uh, in terms of what other countries want, well, obviously other countries as well are um, see kind of they want to have their sense of independence their sense of strategic autonomy and they understand that the that the population uh is not as receptive to having foreign troop presence and i think uh, especially especially so since um since the october 7th and the wars that it has ensued since then so i think uh, both in iraq um in syria uh, we will see less uh troop presence uh perhaps a complete drawdown we might also see um Another another aspect of I think the Trump uh, doctrine, if we can call it, that is much uh, as a whole uh, less uh, much less aid, uh, especially military aid and humanitarian aid to various countries as 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 bribes or as uh, sweetening the pie uh, sweetening the pies and stuff like that. So I think we're going to see a rollback in terms of spending as well. Um, so uh, the United States is going to have to focus back on trying to recover the sources of its uh, military strength. And that means uh, a new kind of um, military strategy, a new kind of national defense uh, posture. Uh, I think America increasingly understands, uh, we here understand that 
things cannot continue as they have. And, and maybe uh, we need to really rethink our force posture as well and maybe invest in certain things you know, than others. And uh, you know, the, the reality of war, both in uh, Ukraine and in Gaza, the way that these wars have been carried out, the importance of drones, the importance of ballistic missiles, um, has made, uh, you know, for example, uh, aircraft carriers, they are becoming less and less meaningful. And this is something that more and more people uh, have noticed and will continue to notice. And that will mean a fundamental shift. Um, you know, right now having like the next and biggest the aircraft, aircraft carrier might be something that is uh, a matter of prestige rather than a matter of, uh, you know, uh, military and strategic, um, you know, vitality. So, uh, so I think we need to understand that. We need to understand that America, in order to be competitive in a much more multipolar, multi aligned multinodal world, needs to change and shift its policies. We have had years and decades of overreach, uh, spending, uh, you know, more than uh, I was reading recently that since uh, since 9-11, around four and a half million people have died um, in, in various centers of war. Um, that is not only immoral, you know, because, you know, I'm not a moralist, but my my problem with it is that it has not been to any interest. It has been a senseless death, both for, you know, for, for us and our troops, but also especially for the region, the devastation that it brought brings to the regions. So the question is for what? And uh, we, as you said, we have moved from one, tal one Taliban 20 years ago to another Taliban. And we have, uh, you know, created circumstances in which um, I believe uh, we have contributed to Israel being less safe because of our policies of not controlling things when we should have. We have, we have uh, our policies are, are, are have been, you know, uh, responsible for changing the dynamics in the region as well. So I think America is less interested in the in the Middle East because it is, uh, you know, we're just living in a different era, and I don't think um, the Middle East is as important to our national security as it was in the seventies. It is a peripheral region, and it's time for us to come come to terms with that. That that means that the region also has to understand how to make its own understanding and make make its own dealings. And it also means that Saudi Arabia and Iran, as the, the two major powers uh, shaping that regional security, understand that they just can't have a cold war because that will create a huge uh, stress on their resources, and it will take away from other priorities. So again, we are living in an age of limitations. And priorities, because we're in a great transition, every country has to come to terms with what that transition means for its own posture, for its own kind of, uh, uh, you know, economic policy, strategic policy, our, its grand vision. And so by doing so, I think we're going to see much, many countries uh, trying to tone it down, trying to find ways of coexisting. And uh, unless they really have uh, genuine security considerations, then they will... Um, they will try to come to the table and have a discussion. And I think uh, it's good to have a less ideological Saudi Arabia and a less ideological uh, Islamic, Republic of, uh, Islamic Republic of Iran. And I think that is something that we are seeing already. And uh, we will also have to see what that looks like in terms of Turkey. But again, it seems like the region as a whole has a certain recalibration in terms of what is what is the architecture, the security architecture that it wants, and then all the different... Uh, Stakeholders in the region want to be, um, you know, want, want to have much more diplomatic engagement with one another. And and uh, as long as you're part of the regional system, uh, you're welcome. Now, the, I'll end on this. I think it is also important in terms of st strategic vision to understand that the only country that has nuclear weapons in the Middle East is Israel. And with this shift happening, uh, you know, that becomes it, in itself unsustainable. So, um, you know, the other, the sort of the more important regional actors uh, in terms of the other side, whether it's Turkey, Iran, or Saudi Arabia, cannot uh, cannot help but shake the feeling that, you know, the reason Israel can do whatever it wants and go without impunity is because Israel is the only country that can escalate without without punishment because it has nuclear weapons. So nuclear weapons, when one country has it, is escalatory. When two countries have it, like India and Pakistan or China and Russia or you know other places that are neighbors, it becomes uh, a guarantee for de-escalation. So I think that is uh, that is something that probably is on the minds of uh, strategic thinkers in the region, and it might even change the calculus in terms of first of all what Iran will do, 
uh, as its deterrence in Lebanon and other proxies is, uh, is becoming diminished by Israeli action, as well as what, um, what Saudi Arabia will look to in terms of, well, maybe having another country with nuclear weapons is not necessarily a bad thing. So, it, you know, all the arguments against the Iranian nuclear weapons also, uh, you know, it will create an arms race between Iran and Saudi Arabia was the number one uh, argument that was usually put forth. I think that's also different because increasingly Iran and Saudi Arabia will have some sim more similar uh, security and defense trajectories in spite of the fact that Saudi Arabia will continue to want a certain sense of security guarantee as a last resort from America. But if America pushes that too hard, uh, it will only alienate Saudi leaders. So again, it's but it's good to see people do, doing calculations of interest, doing um, understanding that neutrality and coexistence are both good things. Wonderful way of wrapping it up on my channel. Uh, Arta, where can people follow you to read about or read from you and read your analysis? Where should they go? Yes, uh, they can go to my Twitter, Arta Moini. Uh, I mean, at Arta Moini, uh, and M O E I N I is my last name. Sometimes people drop the I. Um, but, uh, you know, also peacediplomacy.org is, is our website. Uh, you know, my writings will also appear there, even if I publish in different places. Um, as well as the Agon magazine, uh, that uh, that's the www.agonmag.com. Uh, we put uh, interesting analysis uh, once in a while uh, in Agon Mag as well. I put all of that into the description below. Everybody follow Dr. Arta Moeni. Uh, Arta, thank you very much for your time today. Thank you, Pascal. Thank you. Glad, glad to be here.